today we're going to go over a couple of things. Um, on, well, I'll, I'll come back to this in a minute here. Um, we're going to talk about abstract classes and we're going to talk about interfaces. Right? Um, imagine this scenario. Imagine that, you know, you were working at a pet store and you know, your job was to help customers at a pet store and, and a customer comes in and asks if you have pet food. You're going to say, yeah, we have pet food. And you're going to ask, well, what kind of pet do you have? And what if the person answered something like, well, it's just a pet. And we'd be confused, right? You'd say, well, what kind of pet is it though? Is it a dog? Is it a cat? Is it a fish? You know, I mean, really depending on which kind of pet it is, that's food we have for it. You know, we're, we're not gonna sell dog food to a fish, you know, or, or whatever. And a person's like, nope, it's just a pet. That really doesn't make any sense, all right? Because in that kind of, uh, instance, pet is more of a abstract concept than an actual physical thing. You know, you can point to, you can point to something that is a dog. You can point to something that is a cat. You can't point to something that is a pet that isn't a dog, a cat, fish, a bird, a lizard, whatever, whatever other things make up the world of pets. So there's nothing that is a pet and only a pet. All right. In Java, we have a concept for that that we use, and that concept is abstract class. And an abstract class is a class where you can define behavior and attributes. I, I can you can define behavior. I'm not sure. I have to look up attributes, but you can definitely define behavior, but you can't instantiate it. What do I mean by instantiate it? I mean, you cannot do this. Let's say pet is our abstract class. Not say this. Boy. Can't say that P equals that. If pet is defined as an abstract class, because you have to define it as a specific kind of pet, because pet is defined as an abstract class or a conceptual class. So I have this little example that we'll look at. We have pets defined, and I have just a couple of classes here. I have a pet class, a dog class, and then a unit test class. And we'll open this up, and we'll look at it, and then we'll play with them a little bit and do some things with them and so on. But I want that anymore. way.
with our unit test, which is used to test code. Then have that class have a dog class. All these together. Let's start out looking at the We define a public class, but we add the word abstract to it. That makes it a abstract class. That means that we uh, cannot have uh, any instances of this. We have to make an instance of one of the concrete classes that inherit from this. So public, abstract, class, pet. And I've defined a couple of attributes that I would assume all pets have. All pets probably have a name. They have a cat and don't have a name. I don't know, I'm not counting that as a pet. It's just a stray. <laughs> and all of them have a weight, right? And I've created a constructor to set up those attributes. I then have included some abstract functions. And these abstract functions only contain the definition of the function sometimes called the signature of the function. Signature of the function contains the name of the function, any arguments that it receives, and the return value. So I have two of these abstract functions, and notice there's no body of the code. Uh, another way to say this is there's, a, there's no implementation of the function. We just define that pets have these two functions. All right, as a make sound function that returns a string and get food function that re also returns a string. So now we have our dog class. A dog is a concrete class, right? Because you can have a dog, right? Your pet could be a dog. And pets, in fact, inherit, for our dogs, in fact, inherit from pets because a dog is a kind of pet. A dog isn't an abstract class because you could actually have a dog. You could create a dog instance and that would be valid. You know, your dog is a, is a pet. And I've added a couple of extra attributes associated with it, hair type and how long between toenail cuts do you do? All right, and I've created some constructors. And I've chained these constructors together. We talked about this last week, where we have a constructor that accepts the name, the weight, the kind of hair, and how long before you cut the nails. All right. It will call the super classes constructor and pass the argon weight. It will then set the hair type and set nails for it. If we call it with only three arguments, it changes to this constructor and it defaults the number of weeks for the toenails to six weeks. Finally, we have a two argument constructor. This calls and defaults the hair to short. So we call this constructor, we would call this constructor with a value of short for hair which in turn would call this constructor with a value of six weeks. And then we would call the super classes constructor and then set these other attributes. Uh, again, this is something I mentioned last week, but very soon, as in probably next week, we're gonna get into exceptions. So we're not just gonna trust the set method to accept like, any string at all and not do any validation on it. Right now, there's no validation done, but be patient when we cover exceptions, we'll talk about how to validate that. Now we have our gets and sets. Well, we have our sets anyhow. And we have our gets for our two attributes. I then have a make sound and a get food method. 
right? Because I've said that this extends PET, I have to have for every abstract function defined in PET, I have to have a concrete implementation of it. So here, make sound function simply says that whatever the dog's name is says bow wow. Get food says what a dog typically eats, table scraps, dog food, pretty much whatever they can. I've added another function that is not defined on pet, and that is catch frisbee. It's not at all, you know, fish can't catch a frisbee. So that's not something that all pets can do, but it's something specifically that a dog can do. And it simply returns a string saying that they love to catch frisbees. So let's look at the compiler and compile this, watch it run. And then we'll start messing around with the code to see the implication of it. All right, so I create a, oh, I thought you said I didn't create an instance of it. I can't create an instance of it. Well, I'm not creating an instance of, I'm creating an instance of dog. Remember this side that determines what kind of object is gonna be created. So I am creating a dog object. I'm storing that in a pointer that can contain any pet. Now let's imagine we had a cat object. I could also say pet s equals new cat and give the constructor for that. Now, because it's a pet, I can call any function that's defined on the pet. So I can call make sound, get food, and get class. Get class is a function that's not declared directly on the pet class, but is, is declared on the base Java object from which everything inherits. We'll forget about this for a couple minutes. So let's make sure we save this and let's go and compile it and run it. We're going to compile it and say Java C unit test. Or actually, we're going to compile all of them. So we'll say star.java. Then we're going to run unit test. And spot says, by wow, table scraps. That's the food that the dog eats. And finally, the class that this is is a dog. And we're ignoring these things for a minute. All right. I'm going to make some changes to this code and think what you think the impact is going to be. Is it going to work? Am I going to get a problem? What kind of problem will I get? All right. So let's look in here. And for the dog, Let's eliminate make sound function. So I'm going to cut that. I'm going to save it. You think, do you think that that is going to will it compile correctly? Will it run correctly? It doesn't compile correctly. And look at the error message. I know sometimes these error messages are a little hard to decipher. But that's one of the reasons I go over the error messages that you get. It says that dog is not abstract and does not override abstract method make sound in pet. That's actually a very descriptive error message. What the compiler is telling us is that in this abstract class, there is an abstract method called make sound. 
the dog class extends the pet class. That means that we have to define on any class that extends pet, that inherits from pet, we have to define at the very least these two abstract functions. If we don't, it won't compile. Those abstract functions are just setting a requirement, more or less. They're defining that any class that inherits from this has to have an actual, not an abstract function, but an actual function for this. Or it could be an abstract class itself. Uh, that would be, for example, if we took this really further, if we were, let's say, a dog breeder, and we had uh, a, uh, we could make actually dog an abstract class and then make a specific concrete classes for German shepherds or chihuahuas or beagles or, or uh, um, basset hounds or whatever, right? But in our case, we didn't take it that far. This is the concrete class. And therefore it has to have these two methods in it because these were defined as abstract. So if you ever see that error, that means that you have an abstract class defined with an abstract method and you do not implement it in the class that inherits it. If I were to add a third abstract class to pet, I would also have to make sure that that was implemented in the dog class. What if I do this? Going to happen here. Oh, I forgot to save the one. Two errors. Okay, no suitable constructor found for dog. What this is telling us is, call the constructor with no arguments. This is telling us what the constructors exist on the dog. We have one that accepts a string and an integer, one that accepts two strings or a string, an integer, and another string, and one that can, uh, contains a string, an integer, a string, and an integer. Because we called with no arguments, that's not one of the choices. We have not defined a no argument constructor for this. And because we've defined other constructors for it, that no argument constructor is not automatically generated by the compiler. So that would give us this error. So let's fix that. What if we Eliminate this line of code. Think for a second what's going to happen. Almost a hint, right? I wouldn't bother showing it unless something bad happened, right? If it could work without it, I, I probably wouldn't have had that line of code to begin with, right? So you should sort of assume that there's probably something wrong with this. Make sure I saved everything. All right, let's look at this error. This error says constructor and pet class cannot be applied to the given type. This is saying that the, uh, the, the constructor in the pet class accepts a string and an integer, and we call the no argument. Well, we don't call the no argument function anywhere in here. No, 
but we, by not calling the no argument, by not calling a specific constructor, by default, we end up calling the no argument constructor on pet, and that doesn't exist. These are immune from that because they call another function, another constructor within dog. But since this one doesn't call another constructor within dog, it has to call a constructor in super, super class. All right, let's look at this code now. Created a dog, right? I should be able to call, or you might think I would be able to call the catch frisbee function on the dog. But after all, I defined the catch frisbee function, the dog. I can't, however. What this is saying is there's no catch frisbee function on the class pet. Well, I created a dog. A catch frisbee function should exist. Well, it's like this. Remember what each side of the equal sign means in an expression like this. On the left side, when we define the kind of object pointer, object reference pointer we have, that defines what methods we can call on this object. Because we said pet s, that means that we can only call methods that exist in the pet class. So I can only call constructors and what were the other ones? Uh, make noise and get food or whatever those were. Now, what does this side mean? This side says what version of that function we're gonna get. And what version are we gonna get? We're gonna get the version that exists, the dog class. If I go and eliminate this, those first four statements are gonna work. And it's going to do what we would expect, even though it's a pet, it's going to give me the dog's function because I created it as a dog object. So this determines what functions we can call. This determines what version of the function that we're going to get. And we're going to get the version that lives in the dog class. So now everything should be back to normal. And I should be able to run. And sure enough, I get dogs make sound and the dogs get food. Some of this I realize is review, but I, I know these are kind of tricky concepts. So I'm going to make sure that we go over them enough times. Uh, hopefully, uh, they'll become clearer as you go through this. Now, what is this business here? This business here, I'm saying I'm going to create a, I'm going to store in a dog object reference variable. This object, this pet object up here, converted to being a dog. That's what this says. It says take this object and convert it to a dog. When I do that, then I can call catch frisbee. I can get the number of weeks to cut the toenails and I can get the hair type. This is called casting. I casted or converted this object to be pointed to by a dog object reference pointer, which means now I can call all the functions that are on the dog class. So I can call these other ones. Get frisbee, get tone, toenail weeks, and get hair type. And sure enough, we see that and it works.
Now, when could you use this? Um, you could have used this in, I'm trying to think what example, you could use this in, in either of the two assignments that we've done recently. Let me pull those up on the screen and, and take a look at them. It's lab six and seven, maybe. five and six. A publisher offers three kinds of subscriptions, basic, student, and premium. Now, what most people did, and this was good, and a good way to do this, is they defined the basic subscription as a class and inherited from that student and premium. That's a possible way to do it, right? different way to do it would be to define an abstract subscription class where you'd put all the methods and attributes that all subscriptions have and then inherit that, uh, use that to, to be inherited by the K6. Probably the other example Is another good example too. In fact, this hint, you probably should use an abstract class. The subscription one, I'm not sure if you gain anything by doing uh, an abstract class. By this case, though, books and DVDs. All right, we see that books and DVDs have some behavior in common. They all have a due date. You need to know if they're overdue or not when they're checked out of the library. And then we need to know what the fine is. So there's some behavior that they have in common. But a DVD is not a book. A book is not a DVD. So those two classes can't inherit from each other. What they could do, however, is inherit from an abstract class of something like library material. And you would put in the common behavior maybe as abstract classes or abstract functions. Uh, it doesn't have to be an abstract function in a abstract class, but you could put the abstract function in there. Uh, and uh, you'd in inherit both books and DVDs from the library materials and you'd set it up that way. Any questions about this? The next thing we're going to talk about is very closely related to abstract classes. Good. I, thank goodness I hit record. I, I, I think that halfway through the class. Uh, very closely related to an abstract class. And that is what's called an interface. All right, let's think of the word interface when how it's used like more commonly with, with computer equipment, right? You might say that, uh, you know, that your TV has an HDMI interface, right? Or my microphone has a USB interface. What is that describing? That's describing what you can plug into those things. So my computer has a USB interface here. What does that mean? That means I could get anything that has a USB interface. <laughs> and more or less, you know, with more or less difficulty, it'll work with that computer because it has a USB interface and my device would also have uh, the USB plug. So think of an interface as being like where you, things that you could plug into provided they implement a particular interface. So my computer has a USB interface, therefore any device that implements the USB interface, I can plug into it. Let's think of that as far as code goes. 
And let's think specifically about the Java rule of only having single level inheritance. What I mean by that is a class can only inherit from, maybe single level is the wrong word, uh, single inheritance. A class can only inherit from one other class. Now, there could be a chain of classes, right? I could have an animal class and have inherited from that a dog class, inherited from that a German shepherd, Schnauzer, Basset Hound, inherit from German Shepherd, maybe, I don't know if there's special kinds of German Shepherds or whatever, but I could have a chain of inheritance, but each individual class can only inherit from one class above it, one super class. And I think we touched on the reasons for that. Things would get really complicated if I've allowed for multiple inheritance, like what constructors would get called. What if both of the things, what if both of the superclasses had the same function name? What do you do? That's confusing. Yet, in any kind of system, you're liable to have some entity that fits under two categories. It is two things. Remember I said that when we look at inheritance, we look at an is a test. In other words, a dog is an animal, or a dog is a type of animal. That's a true statement. So therefore, we can say that a dog inherits from animal. A car is a vehicle, right? So we can say that Car, if we had a vehicle class, we could make an automobile class that inherited from the vehicle class. Now, could we inherit tire from either of those classes? No, because a tire is not an automobile. A tire is not a vehicle. A tire is part of an automobile. So there might be some relationship between those classes, but it's not an inheritance-based relationship. If you think about it, and again, these are maybe some far-fetched far-fetched uh, examples, but we'll, we'll come to a more concrete one when we actually look at the example code. Um, you could have, for example, a bird is an animal and a bird is also a flying thing, all right? Let's say we we're writing some kind of system where we needed stuff about animals and stuff about things that fly, right? A bird flies, a bird is a flying thing. A bird is also an animal. So you conceivably could make the bird inherit from either of those two classes, but you can't do both. So typically what you do is you inherit from the one that the is a test is a little strong, stronger on. Like in that case, I'd say, yeah, a bird's an animal that, you know, and oh yeah, the bird also flies, but Primarily, you would think of a bird as being an animal. Uh, what do you do with the other stuff, though? The other stuff you can create an interface for. And what do we mean by an interface here? We mean that we can plug, if we write our class to implement an interface, we can plug that class in anywhere that requires a flying object. So how do we create an interface? Well, it's very similar to an abstract class with abstract methods. I've created a couple different classes. I'm going to draw a class diagram first. Because I only did like part, I only created the code for like part of this. Part of this uh, 
part of this uh, uh, example system. Let me draw let's say we have suppliers, our customers. We have our students. It's undergrad, grad. Maybe student. Say we have a class for the people of a college. We have faculty, a student. We have our suppliers. We could have our customers. These are Companies. Customer for a college might be a, a firm that contracts to do to do custom training for them. These are two companies. These are people. All right. What do these all have in common? Send email to all of these. All of these things can be email recipients. All right. People at the college are email recipients, right? We can send to all faculty or all students or whatever. Our suppliers are email recipients, and so would our customers be. And we can't really fit that into the scheme. We can't easily fit that into the scheme. So what we do is we define what's called an interface. And what does an interface look like? Well, it looks a lot like an abstract function, even though we don't call it an abstract, uh, abstract class or abstract function. So I just defined a couple of classes here, student, supplier, and my unit test class along with an interface for or emailable because it's an interface i can't instantiate it directly so i cannot say Emailable X equals new emailable. All right. Just like I couldn't instantiate an abstract class. But all these functions are not going to have the body of the function. Now, here's a, a little footnote. This is the way we're treating uh, interfaces. In later versions of Java, you can actually write some concrete methods and interfaces, but we're not going to think about those right now. That's just going forward, you might encounter that. So this is like an abstract function, except we do not inherit from this class, we implement it. And you might think that's a, you know, is that just a, uh, just playing word games here? No. There's a difference. A class can implement as many interfaces as it wants to. What does it mean when I say that I'm implementing an interface? It means that I'm going to have 
this function in it. I have to define a function with this signature in my student and supplier classes. And here I do. Now, might be a different way of implementing it, right? For example, students have a first name and last name, and a student's email address is derived by this college anyhow. There's a similar scheme at LC, but it's a little more complicated. Your first name plus a period plus your last name, plus I think there's a sequence number here at LC, but we're ignoring that at mail.lorraineccc.edu. A supplier, there's no scheme for determining the email address. We simply, that, that comes in as an attribute. We set that with the constructor. Now in the unit test, what we can do is I can create emailables, create a student, and send email. Anywhere that an emailable is used, I can plug a student in, I can plug a, supp a supplier in. And of course, we're going to get the right version of the function that's defined on the student and on the supplier. So let's compile and run this. It's not instructed, does not override send email. Oh. I did this on purpose. I did this on purpose the first time I created this example. Notice it says send email alone with two L's. So it doesn't implement that. Good. Spelled wrong. Track the spelling for this to work. I just wanted to demonstrate that you have to, you have to implement the function that the, any of the functions are defined in the interface. Now I should be able to compile it. And now I can run it. And you see, this puts together the name, or you CCC, this sends the email to just whatever the constructor set the email for. Now, we can take this just a little bit further if we want to. I'm gonna write a function I'm going to say uh, create the function called send. And I could call this function path it pass in both S and V. You might look and say, how can I do that? I'm passing a student and supplier object here. Yes, I am. But those objects implement 
emailable interface, and therefore I can plug students and suppliers anywhere that a emailable is required. So this function requires an emailable. These two things implement the emailable uh, uh, interface. Therefore, I can call this function and pass these arguments. And we should get the same results as we had before. But let's just verify that. And static variable. Worse. Okay. Um, and the problem is that with this is this is a um, these are fine as part of a static function, or I can't all oh, can't use that to call this method. So. Anyhow, if I had another object that had a send method that was expecting an emailable, I could call that. What's more, let's say I had a mass email function, right, in some mass emailer class. I could create all of my suppliers, all my students in a gigantic array list, move through that array list, because that array list accepts emailable, I can put suppliers and students on it. And I can, for each element in that list, I could send all the send email function and send the email. So we can plug that into anywhere that an emailable is needed, whether it be an array list, a function, anything like that. These are closely related, but slightly different. The next assignment, we verify that, I think that's lab eight, deals with interfaces. We have all these devices. They're not really related. Computers, televisions, electric blanket, light bulbs. However, they're all AC powered. So we could create a interface for AC powered that have two methods. A two string method that will return a description of the device, example, light bulb 40 watts, electric blanket, at seven, and so on and a get kilowatts per hour. And then I have the way that each of these devices does a calculation, how many kilowatts per hour. Uh, don't come at me if these numbers aren't correct. I don't know how many kilowatts an electric blanket uses. I made up numbers, all right? <laughs> so hopefully they're not too far off the mark. But again, uh, what this means is when you create a light bulb, electric blanket, television, and computer class, they're all going to implement this interface, and they're all going to have get kilowatt hours as a method. You're then going to create an array list that contains these devices. You're going to create several of each of these devices, enough to thoroughly test it. Then you're going to loop through that array list and come up with the total kilowatt hours for each of the devices you put on the all right, are there any questions? No. Okay, great. That's all I have for today. Uh, we will either see you next week or see you in lab.